Greetings, listeners. Today's podcast consists of two wonderful topics. We will first be joined by Mr. Jim Hayes, the CEO of Spirit America, where we will discuss the organization and its role in supporting the Army's mission and the national defense efforts. This recording will then be followed with an update from AUSA's adopted deployment, First Care, Second ABCT, the Black Jack Brigade. They will share insights and highlights about their current deployment to Europe, and we'll also touch upon their COVID-19 response. So without further ado, let's get real. Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Army Real Talk. For today's episode, we are joined by Mr. Jim Hake, founder and chief executive officer of Spirit of America. Welcome, Mr. Hake. Great to be here. Mr. Haig, thank you for joining us today. We are really happy to have you here and very excited to learn more about you and your organization, Spirit of America. Yes, please introduce yourself to our listening audience, as well as give us some insight of your organization to include its mission. I am Jim Haig. I'm the founder and chief executive officer of Spirit of America. We are a nonprofit founded in response to a national emergency, the attacks of 9-11. And our mission is to support the safety and success of Americans serving abroad, and the local people and partners they seek to help. So we have a unique relationship with the U.S. military and especially the U.S. Army. We have U.S. military veterans who work on the ground alongside deployed troops all over the world. And our job is to fill the gaps between what's needed locally in support of U.S. missions abroad fill the gaps between what's needed and what government can do. So we bring private assistance, private know-how, private funding to fill those gaps, all of which is to make our troops safer and to help them spread American values in some very difficult parts of the world. Very nice. Thank you for sharing that. Sir, it's also noted that Congress recognizes Spirit of America as a partner in supporting the mission of deployed United States personnel around the world working alongside U.S. service members and diplomats to improve their safety and success. Can you please tell us more about some of the missions and the overall footprint that you cover? Yes, Spirit of America has implemented over 1,100 projects in 77 countries. We've received support from 16,000 individual American donors, and we've provided very flexible support in exact response to what U.S. troops say is needed on the ground in places like Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, West Africa, Central and South America, the Philippines, and Vietnam. So, for example, in Iraq, we have provided metal detectors and first aid kits and DPS devices. Working with U.S. Special Forces, we provided those items to their Peshmerga partners. Same thing in Syria with the uh, Syrian Democratic Forces. Everything we've done in those cases is because U.S. Army Special Forces and Marine Special Operators have said this is what their partners need to help succeed in their mission. So we've done that exactly at the point of need and exactly what was needed. In West Africa, working with U.S. Army Special Operations Forces, we've helped them prevent war in Niger. And the way that that worked was we provided livestock health support and met youth employment needs by providing scholarships for tribal youth, get veterinary education, and then go back to meet the livestock health needs of their tribes. The purpose of all that was to improve stability in areas that were targeted by extremist groups who wanted to plunge Niger into chaos and war. And that very targeted assistance was exactly what was needed in that case to help move the the tribes and the youth of those tribes in the right direction and improve stability. In Ukraine, we helped stand up a Army FM radio station operated by the Ukrainians as an answer to Russian propaganda. So the Ukrainian soldiers in the thick of the fight in the eastern part of Ukraine were targeted and bombarded by Russian propaganda, misinformation through every possible channel, from text messages to social media, television and radio. So our support to stand up a radio station so that the Ukrainians could meet the information needs of their own soldiers was done to very great effect. That's been operational for about three years now. 
and has helped bolster the Ukrainian forces in uh, a very difficult fight against Russia and, and Russian-backed separatists. So everywhere we go, it varies based on what the circumstances call for, what the gaps are, and where private assistance can make the difference between success and failure. Fascinating. So my question, and this is kind of putting you on the spot, is could you share a story about maybe your favorite or remarkable act that Spirit of America has done to help others? Well, I'll give two examples, and they're very different examples. One is uh, working with U.S. Army Special Forces team that was in Kirkuk at the height of the fight against the Islamic State against ISIS. In a matter of days, we provided tourniquets and GPS devices to the Peshmerga partner forces working with our U.S. Army Special Forces. Mm -hmm. The master sergeant of that Special Forces team, that ODA, later told us that that assistance helped turn the momentum of the battle with ISIS in Kirkuk for two reasons. One, the tourniquets ended up providing life-saving assistance on the battlefield to the Peshmerga. Uh, Before Mm -hmm. the tourniquets that we provided, many more Peshmerga were dying because they were bleeding out on the battlefield. And the tourniquets helped save lives immediately. And that change in dynamics affected the momentum of the battle. The second thing was the GPS devices allowed the Peshmerga to precisely identify their location so the U.S. could provide close air support to, again, turn the momentum of the battle. And the master sergeant credits that bit of support. Those things that I just mentioned only cost $6,000. That uh, little bit of support with turning the tide of the battle and helping his team and the Peshmerga defeat ISIS in Kirkuk and prevent a huge disaster if the Islamic State had taken over the population area as well as the oil fields in Kirkuk. Very, very awesome. Just remarkable. So how does Spirit of America select these different projects to support? Spirit of America receives guidance from higher levels, higher levels in the military command, usually from the Theater Special Operations Command in terms of priority countries, priority issues. And then we proactively get down on the ground and talk to the people, the soldiers, sailors, airmen and Marines who are closest to whatever the problem and objective that they're trying to solve are. So we work in a very uh, decentralized manner, and it's all about supporting the initiative of the Americans closest to the problem. So we engage in direct dialogue, both in person and through email and phone calls and WhatsApp, text messages, whatever it takes, so that we're understanding what our troops say is needed to support their safety and to help them succeed in their difficult missions. Very nice. Sir, you and your organization are definitely highly engaged in supporting the Army mission and the overall defense of our nation. As a combat veteran with considerable amount of overseas in the combat zone, I would like to say a special thank you to you. And I believe you said you have 16,000 donors, around 16,000 donors. In the morning, you probably have 16,001. What goals do you set for your organization to accomplish in the future? Well, where we are right now is we've just scratched the surface of the potential need for an impact of our assistance. So we're not able to cover down on many of the things that we would like to be able to support in terms of the needs of U.S. missions abroad. So we need to grow the organization and we need to grow from uh, where we are today, which is a very small team of about 20 people, up to about 50 people in the next several years. So at least we have the kind of geographic coverage that's needed to support U.S. objectives around the world. And from there, we'll see where the organization needs to go to meet the needs for our support. The key thing is that what we represent is the ability to connect Americans who want to help with the things that actually need to be done on the ground in these very difficult environments. So we give a person in uh, Milwaukee or Buffalo or California the ability to, in effect, reach halfway around the world and deliver assistance exactly at the point of need in support of what our troops are trying to accomplish. So we are currently dealing with this coronavirus or COVID-19 epidemic worldwide. How has this affected Spirit of America? Well, as with uh, our U.S. government partners, all non-mission critical 
travel has been ceased for us. That's been about two weeks now. We've gone virtual in terms of our operations, so there are very few, if any, people at our headquarters in Arlington. And we operate in a distributed fashion in any case, so going virtual is not very difficult for us. But we're still, even though we're not traveling today, we're in regular touch with our U.S. military and foreign service partners to understand how we can provide uh, assistance even in these difficult times. So we're able to uh, do a lot of things remotely that need to be done, but it does make it a little bit more challenging for sure. We understand that. And then perhaps in the next couple of weeks, we could have this discussion again to see what Spirit of America has implemented to continue to support where needed. Absolutely. And then before we close, I'm wondering, is there anything else you would like to share with our listening audience to include any websites or social media platforms? Yes, uh, people can go to our website at spiritofamerica.org and see immediate needs from Vietnam, from Iraq and Syria, Afghanistan, many of the world's most difficult, challenging environments and hotspots. These are things that we're identifying and working with those who are serving abroad in terms of what they need to be safer and to come home proud of their success. So people can look at that on our website, again, spiritofamerica.org and see the things that are needed today in these very difficult environments. So we invite people to join our email list to support a project if they would like to support a project. And if people do want to support a project, what our commitment is that 100% of the funding that they contribute will go directly to the cost of that project without any deductions for overhead and, and that sort of thing. That is our 100% promise to your listeners and to anyone who supports the organization. Mr. Haig, thank you for joining us today and providing our listeners with information about your organization. We look forward to supporting your efforts in the future and especially thank you for what you have done, you and your team have done, and what you are doing and what you will do in the future. Thank you. Yes, thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And what we represent is the vast number of Americans who want to help. And we're connecting those Americans who want to help to things that need to be done. And what we like to say is that we make it as easy for people to help America as it is to identify the problems that we have. So thanks very much for having me on today. Have a good one and continue to serve through Spirit of America. Thank you. Today we will have a update from AUSA's Adopted Deployed Unit, 2nd ABCT, 1st Cav Division, Blackjack Brigade. We are joined today by Lieutenant Colonel Tim Metters and Sergeant Major David Cox. We will start with brief introductions. Lieutenant Colonel Metters, can you please introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Lieutenant Colonel Tim Metters. I command 1st Battalion, 5th Cavalry Regiment. Uh, that's assigned to 2nd Armored Brigade Combat Team out of 1st Cavalry Division. We are a combined arms battalion with two mechanized infantry companies and a tank company. Of course, we have our support with our headquarters and headquarters company and our forward support company. But I'm an infantry officer currently in board deployed and support of Operation Atlantic Resolve. Oh, thank you. Sergeant Major Cox, can you introduce yourself, please? Uh, yes, sir. I'm uh, Command Sergeant Major Dave Cox. I'm the Command Sergeant Major of uh, 1st Battalion, uh, 8th U.S. Cavalry Regiment, also within the 2nd Brigade Combat Team, uh, Blackjack Brigade of the 1st Cavalry Division. So uh, although I've uh, long considered myself a paratrooper by trade, uh, I think that the Army cr armor community welcomed me into the fold just uh, a few years ago. Uh, since then, I've learned a lot about the, uh, the firepower that uh, this sort of a unit, uh, quote unquote, heavy unit brings into the fight. Uh, what is most impressive to me about it is that uh, is the precision and the technical competency of the crews who operate these platforms, like the uh, M1 Abrams tank, the M2 Bradley fighting vehicle. Uh, when paired with the uh, flexibility of our infantry and all the resources at the disposal of a uh, brigade combat team, I would say this is easily the most technically proficient and tactically aggressive unit that I've ever been a part of in my uh, two decades of service. Uh, even after all my years, I'm still in awe of what a uh, combined arms battalion can bring to the fight. Thank you. We're real excited to hear the updates from the brigade and see what you're doing out there in this very important mission. 
Colonel Metters, can you please tell us about any kind of joint exercises, key leader engagements that you and the unit are involved with? Absolutely. And I think to back up, as we talk about joint exercises and key leader engagements, my battalion is in what we call a very distributed environment. So I've actually got a company assigned to this country of Bulgaria. My tank company's there. I've got a 21 soldier detachment in Georgia working with the Georgians. And I've got the remainder of my battalion in uh, Romania. So as we look at our footprint in Georgia, Bulgaria, and Romania, it gives us a unique opportunity to partner with and work alongside three very different countries with three very different militaries, but all very interested in in working with us, training with us, and uh, helping us to get better as we help them to get better. As I work throughout this footprint, train throughout this footprint, I'm very fortunate to be able to work alongside the Bulgarians, Romanians, and the Georgians at all echelons. So I've been able to interact with, you know, their chiefs of staff, their general officer corps, all the way down to their squads. So as we talk key leader engagements, you know, there's been a point in time when one of my companies was partnered with four infantry squads from the Romanian army. There's been a point in time when a T-72 platoon from the Bulgarian army was partnered with one of my companies. Then routinely, my 21 soldier detachment in Georgia works along with Georgian infantry battalions as they go through the combat training center that the Georgian uh, military is, is standing up out on the east side of the Black Sea. So we are keenly aware of the partnerships at all echelons. You know, we just published an article where a, a NATO general who commands the multinational division southeast headquartered in Bucharest, Romania, came to visit us during training. So that's a great engagement that we were able to have. And, and he was able to sit down and talk with my company commander, the first sergeant, and give us an LPD. But also he was able to see us do a tank platoon live fire. So all that in combination gives us a great opportunity to be influenced by our partners, but to also influence our partners. So the training, what we'd like to say is at echelon. And although it's not formal exercises, to a degree, we've been able to train from the squad level all the way up to the company level. Uh, just last week, I validated my tank company. So we were in the training range in Bulgaria with two M1 Abrams platoons, one M2A3 Bradley fighting vehicle platoon, and then a platoon of T-72s. So just a unique opportunity for my guys to be able to do that, unique opportunity for me to be able to evaluate that. But that's what happens here in what we call AOR South. But to that point, too, we're also going to do a rather large exercise uh, in mid-March uh, where we'll bring together elements from the multinational brigade southeast, so the NATO brigade, uh, along with one of my company from the Polish military contingent that's assigned to Romania, and then also a company of Romanian infantry. So all that brought together uh, allows us really to see the whole gamut from training at squad level to operating a battalion task force. Uh, in support of our partnership and in support of our partners. Outstanding. Thank you for that update. Sounds like you guys are out there doing amazing things, and we appreciate it back here on this side. Star Major Cox, can you share with us some information about the soldiers and some highlights and interactions that they're having with their international counterparts? Yes, sir. Our uh, brigade has recently been part of a multinational exercise known as Combined Resolve 13. It's an intensive training event that we conducted in the terrain of Bavaria, which if you've never been to Bavaria, it is probably the most rugged terrain that I've ever operated in uh, outside of Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. The exercise was designed to stress our ability to deploy and fight and win against a professional near-peer adversary. All the while, we're fighting alongside our uh, allied forces and partners. For anyone that is unfamiliar to the JMRC, uh, it's one could equate it to a rotation at the National Training Center. So we learn a lot from our NATO allies when we conduct these mission sets. Uh, They're designed to test our interoperability in a fast-paced environment against a thinking enemy. And I think that the difference in our language is almost always the first subject that comes to mind when uh, discussing potential challenges that we may face together. Uh, For all the concern that we put into this, I think our soldiers found this to be the easiest to overcome. I guess you could say that actions speak louder than words. Hmm. In that type of an environment, we have a common mission with our allied partners and shared hardships brought about by the terrain, the weather, and the actions of the opposing force. Uh, When we're working toward a common goal, even a language barrier is overcome by our mutual respect and appreciation for one another. 
As you know, when we go to war, we don't go alone. Strong international military partnerships are paramount in the defense of our nation and to ensure we are ready to fight together and fight to win. Before we close today, I want to open it up and hand the uh, microphone back off to you two just to see if you have any closing comments. You know, you talked about the need to partner and how that is directly tied to our national security. And what, what we're definitely seeing really is uh, what uh, Sergeant Major Cox talked about. You know, these strong partnerships are built off of strong relationships. And what we were able to do at the individual and small unit level is manifesting itself into strong partnerships all the way up to the heads of these land forces. So as, as you share this message uh, with your constituents, I really appreciate the platform uh, that allows us to share what we're seeing in Europe, share what I'm seeing in Georgia, Bulgaria, and Romania, and highlight just the keen awareness that our partners have on working with us, not just working for us or we're working for them, but this idea of working together and training together as we all get bigger, stronger, and faster together. Cool. Sorry, Major Cox? Yes, sir. Hey, I just also want to take the, uh, the opportunity to thank you again for this moment to speak to our AUSA supporters back home and listeners around the world. This mission really has been one of the highlights of my career. Uh, our brigade has accomplished a lot in the months since we deployed in support of this operation, and, and we still have a few important challenges in front of us. It's not over yet. Uh, but I just want our families who are listening back home to know that they should be proud of all that their soldiers have accomplished. I would like to say thank you from all of us at AUSA and our audience for taking time out of your busy schedules while deployed to provide us these updates. And most importantly, I'd like to say thank you to the soldiers carrying out the great mission and also the family members back home supporting them. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Army Matters podcast on iTunes and everywhere podcasts are found. Join us next Monday with a brand new episode of Army Matters with Family Voices. The Army Matters podcast series is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member supported, Army connected. Visit us at AUSA.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission to educate, inform, and connect with the total Army, our industry partners, and our supporters of a strong national defense. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at AUSA.org. Have a great Army day. Hua. Cool